Okay, well, I'll start off. Some people might continue to arrive. Lovely to see you all on this Friday afternoon. Um, so my name is Pamela Humphreys and I'm the convener of the Peel SIG. And I'd just like to introduce the other conveners, uh, Marta Skirbis, uh, Catherine Alston and John Smith. And also um, Sophie O'Keefe, who I'm sure you all know, the, um, the, uh, the manager of uh, PD for English Australia, who is, who is lurking today, but she's busy behind the scenes. So welcome, welcome everybody to Developing Appeal Agent Workshop, Principles and Practice. Um, just before we get going and while we're waiting for people to arrive, just to remind you what this SIG uh, was set up for and what we do here. So we are the post-entry English and Academic Language SIG. The special interest group and we look at um, the, the aim is to uh, provide a shared forum for the exchange of expertise experience and resources to promote best practice in post entry and what we mean by post entry is after students have met the condition to enter their uh, their destination program in higher ed tertiary education vet or foundation they've already met the language condition but they still need to develop their, their academic language for that setting this is actually our 10th event of the SIG, so we're very happy to be in double figures today. And uh, this is our fourth event of the year and the last event of the year. Um, you may remember, those of you who've been attending our events, you may remember that not too long ago, we ran an event called Archetypal Support Mechanisms in Post-Entry Academic Language and Learning. And one of those um, archetypal support mechanisms was what we called the adjunct tutorial. So we're going to focus on that today. So I'm gonna hand over to Kat, who's gonna take us through uh, the abstract and uh, kick off the workshop today. Thanks a lot, Pamela, and welcome everyone. It's great to see so many people here, as Pamela said, on a rainy and sunny Friday. Um, so jumping into it. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to the interactive workshop. And today we'll focus on, as Pamela said, one of the most common post-entry English and academic language support mechanisms, the adjunct workshop. Um, and in higher education context, the adjunct support workshops uh, usually sit alongside a unit of study, for example, and supplement and complement core learning activity. Uh, so in the session today, we'll begin with an example scenario that you may possibly encounter in the post-entry learning support space. Uh, and then using this scenario, we'll then explore how to approach developing an adjunct workshop by discussing through four key steps. And these steps include liaising with the content specialist, the academic perhaps, working out what information you need in order to help. The next step looks at unpacking key inputs from both academics and students. Then we move on to designing the content. And finally, closing the loop. How would you report back to the academic? Uh, following this, at the end of the session, we'll summarize some fundamental principles um, from our discussion for developing adjunct tutorials. And I can see lots of participants in the room who bring with them a lot of experience in this space as well. So it'll be great to share ideas um, as we discuss. For the first three steps, we'll discuss in breakout rooms, and then we'll come back to the main room for feedback. And John has kindly offered to record the feedback in a Padlet. Uh, for step four and for the final principles and the summary, we'll all stay together in the main room. And once again, John will um, scribe and record the feedback on a Padlet which we'll then share at the end of the session for you all. So we capture the ideas that we've discussed. So now if we move to the scenario, let's jump straight into it. So I will read it out to set the scene. So you've been approached by an academic who teaches Rocket Science 101 to first year undergraduates. The academic explains that the students can't write in English. And there's a high fail rate, especially in one assessment tasks for, task for both international and domestic students. The academic asks you if you can help by providing a workshop outside of their regular lecture and tutorials. So um, the first step that we'll look at 
is what information do you need in order to help? So if we just go to the next slide, yeah. So first step, what information do you need in order to help? So now we'll go into breakout rooms. Um, we'll have small groups in the breakout rooms. so you can have a chance to discuss this. And then in about eight minutes, or oh, exactly eight minutes, we'll come back to the full room and uh, gather your ideas. And um, the facilitators or the conveners of the SIG will also pop around to uh, different rooms as you chat. So Sophie will put you in the breakout rooms now. Thank you, Sophie. And look forward to hearing what you come up with. The breakout rooms coming up. And here we go, perfect. If you just jump into a breakout room. I'm just going to broadcast the question to all the rooms. Okay, it looks like we've only got three rooms. So um, any preferences? Um, Let's just go in order then. John one. Catherine two, Marta three, and I'll just go and round them on. Okay, I'll go to two. I might, I'll come out early too. Okay, okay, I'll go in two then, hello. Uh, yeah, do you want to go in two? Actually, I might not go in one now. Okay. Because I'll just what get my... I... How do I choose my room? How Which do one do you... You can just click on join, Pamela. <laughs> oh, I see. Room. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Sophie. Sophie, do you want to stop sharing your screen? So I've shared it into the breakout rooms. Oh, okay. No worries. No worries. Yeah. That's what do. yeah. Um, so then when they come back, you'll stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. if you just if you already broadcasted the message, I can probably already stop sharing anyway. Maybe, um, maybe, yeah, because then yeah. they can see each other more. Yeah. Okay. Cool. We've got someone else just coming in now. Yeah, I'll pop her in. Cool. Thank you. Katie. Hello. Hi, how are you going? Hi, um, good, thanks. Yeah, we've um, actually just gone into uh, breakout room discussions, so I can pop I'm you sorry, in. I've just finished appointments. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. We, no um, worries. We are discussing a scenario um, and uh, we're just talking about a question, what information do you need in order to help in that scenario? So I'll pop you into one of the groups. Thank you. Graham, do you want to go into a group as well? Sure, yeah. Sure. Yeah, great. I might broadcast the scenario to everyone too, so. Yeah, good idea, Kat. It's too Tina. long. Ah, uh, okay. I can pop up, um, I can share that screen to the rooms. That might be actually a good idea, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll Thanks that. for that. Yeah, sure, Tina, I'll pop you in now. Thanks, Sophie.
Hi, Tricia. We're just in breakout rooms. Hi. Hi. Um, I'll put you into a breakout room. Sure. But I'll just tell you what we're doing first. Yes. Sorry, um, sorry I, can't, I can't see your video. It's just black, but that's okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we're just discussing the scenario on the screen. Okay. Uh, and we're going to work through it in four steps. And the first step to discuss in the breakout room is what information do you need in order to help? Right. Okay. So, uh, I'll put you in a breakout room and then you can discuss with the group and we'll be coming back in uh, three minutes or so. Okay, thanks. Yeah, okay. Welcome back, everyone. I think we'll just wait for everyone to come back in. John, are you poised with your Padlet? Everyone else is using the last 58 seconds. Okay, I think that's everyone back uh, now. So now we've got about five minutes to hear uh, all the amazing things you talked about in your breakout rooms and John will add them to the Padlet. Uh, so for this, if you would turn on your camera, that would be fantastic. Um, and also maybe if you raise your hand, if you want to jump in um, to report back about something. So we'll start with breakout room one. Is there someone who is a, a self-appointed spokesperson for room one? And I can't do my Alicost teacher technique of nominating someone because I do not know who was in room one. I'll go if you like. Um, Fantastic. Thank you, David. <laughs> so um, first of all, what 
what does the let well we thought a two-way dialogue with the lecturer would be very useful um from that we'd find out what the uh, well before that we'd want to find out what exactly the assessment was that students were failing on some examples of student work where they would failed some examples of student work where they had done very well so that we knew what the lecturer was hoping for the assessment of course would include instructions task rubric um marking rubric i should say um and so on okay, um, great um sorry david oh, that's fantastic i just want to check that john you're getting all of this in the padlet because it's not coming up on the padlet at the moment on the the share screen it's it's yeah. in a little it's in a little box at the bottom Kat, oh it's know? in a little box sorry i missed the little box it's okay, there fantastic. and then I'll, pub I'll publish it as soon as i as soon as room one finishes and then I'll got it got it so I was just, yeah. I didn't want all this gold to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fantastic. Uh, David, did you want to add anything else? Um, we want to know about logistics, like um, how, how many hours do we have for the workshop? Um, mm. Do we get a chance to get some two-way dialogue after the workshops um do we get a chance to set expectations because we we don't want the lecturer thinking that we're going to work magic and suddenly in a one hour tutorial the student <laughs> will be writing by his definition at a very high standard mm, mm, mm. fantastic thank you a lot of very amazing ideas there anything um or, sorry anything i've missed anyone else who was in group one No, I, oh, David. <laughs> I didn't know I was in group one until you popped up. I didn't take notice of the group. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyone in group two? It's a hard act to follow, isn't it, going uh, <laughs> after that? Anything else we discuss group two? The, Alex. Yeah, the instructions, not just the rubrics, but also the instructions. When you say instructions, you mean for the task? Yeah, for the task, yeah, for the assessment task. And yep. also just the perspective of what is the most important issue from that needs addressing, whether it's plagiarism or poor structure or poor grammar. Although, again, we'll need to see the example to see if it matches. And... Mm. But I think you've raised a, a good point there, Alex, about the perspective of the academic. And then also the assessment of the academic and language and learning expert as well and how they intersect. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. And anyone from uh, group three? I'll go, Kat. Yes, fantastic. We we covered most of the same ground of as David and Alex have covered. We started by saying we need to find out information about three main things about the cohort who they are, what their strengths and weaknesses are and so forth, about the assessment itself and about the course that the assessment sits in. And then we drilled down and mentioned a heap of things uh, along the lines of what uh, David's mentioned. Two two things that we, we talked about were whether or not uh, uh, any adjunct workshop or workshops uh, was going to be compulsory and how that would be achieved, mm. whether yeah. it were voluntary and what that means. That was, that was uh, another thing that we talked about. And um, there was something else I was going to say, but it slipped my mind. That's okay. That point about the adjunct, uh, the compulsory or voluntary is really important because that will determine the level of engagement um, and then also perhaps resourcing that you need to put into it as well, how many people are going to teach it, et cetera. Yeah. I remembered, I remembered Kat. It was, yeah. it, we, 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 sort of speculated that if the domestic cohort and the international cohort were equally doing poorly in the lecturer's mind, then it might have something to do with how the task or the assessments being scaffolded to the students, how it's being explained, how much support they're given in actually understanding and doing the assessment. There might mm. be a problem there that isn't necessarily an English problem or an academic literacy problem. Yes, yes. And then that also raises the question of um, the tactfulness that you employ in um, discussing or raising that with the academic too, I think. And I, uh, in the group I popped into, I think you were also, Grace, you had mentioned that as well. Did you want to say something about that? Yeah, I just mentioned that um, I'm actually new to my role at Academic Skills here. Um, 
an email. <laughs> um, and I mentioned to my manager the other day, how do I get to that point with my academic contacts where I can have those sort of conversations because being my first semester, building these connections with them, I'm not yet at that point where I can have those discussions with most of them. I'm sort of waiting for that. <laughs> mm. But then, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. It is a difficult one. And I think um, also we find that every relationship with every different academic is going to be different and you need to approach it in a really different way. And that's even with academics teaching on the same unit of study. So it's that real, those sort of, um, yeah, those negotiation skills and building relationships and changing your approach depending on the academic and all of the contextual factors that sit around that. So it's quite, um, it's a challenge and it's a skill as well. Well, thank and you so one, much. And, yep. sorry, and one point that uh, Kit raised but didn't mention, uh, uh, he rolled his eyes at uh, the mention of art workshop. He wanted to know whether it was going to be one or whether it would be ongoing in some way. And uh, there was also the question of whether the lecturer him or herself would be part of the adjunct workshop. Fantastic. Thanks, Nicholas. Yeah, no, that's that's a very, very good point. Yeah. So, um, I think, John, you've captured all of that. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Some uh, really good points raised there. I will now hand over to Pamela to take us through uh, the next step. Thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everyone. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Well, actually, you've been a bit too good because you've kind of jumped to step two a little bit anyway, but I'm just going to go back to step one and just have a look at some notes that we made as a team before we started to see if anything's kind of been missed. Um, we talked a lot about the cohort it's really important to understand who the cohort is. So you, you mentioned that. So finding out the makeup of the international domestic cohort. And in our group, group two, we talked about, um, it's, it's not always easy for the academic to know whether students are international or domestic and they might make some overgeneralizations um, and they won't, you won't necessarily be able to find out information like which pathway they came through. That's not generally very practical, in fact. Um, I think um, the comment from room two about the perspective, uh, was it room, uh, from room one who said, who sets the expectations? That is absolutely critical to think about, to agree with the academic, what the expectations are, and what improvement they want to see and whether that's manageable, actually. To have those conversations about what's realistic is really critical. Um, what else? Oh, and the specific task that they want to focus on. Um, sometimes they're not clear. So trying to constrain them, especially Kit, if it's only one tutorial and it's not a whole series, what can you realistically do in one tutorial, in one um, adjunct tutorial? So being very realistic um, about what's possible. All right, so um, we're going to move to step two, which is um, what would you... That's good, okay. <laughs> what would you do next? Decide how to help the academic and to help the student. Now, some of you have actually already jumped ahead to that, to that um, question. So you know who the cohort is now. You know what the academic perceives the issue to be. And maybe you've got some information. Maybe you've even got some input. So what would you do next? So this is a conversation with the academic. And I want you to think about two things. What are you going to do to help the academic? and you started to tease out some of those things. And what are you going to do from the student perspective? So you're thinking about it from two different perspectives. What do you do next before you can begin to design your workshop? What are you going to look at, unpack, consider? All right, thinking about it from the academic and the student perspective. We're going to put you into a number of rooms randomly again to have a chat um, and we'll see you on the other side. Thank you, Sophie. Okay, hello everybody. I thought I was stuck in a breakout room there for a moment. We're all back. We're back. Getting there. Okay, awesome. But we had a fantastic discussion um, in our in our group. I hope you did too. Um, so let's think. In the question, it said, "How? What would you decide to do next to help the academic and to help the student?" Let's start with the student. So I'd like to hear um, what you thought um, you would need to look at to help the student. So. Um, Let's start with, I'm not gonna start with room one, John, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess, mess up with your thing. I'm gonna start room four. <laughs> room four, what did you discuss? 
about supporting the student? I think that might have been us, Pamela. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. It was, we, Sue. Ah, okay. We had a long discussion about needs analysis, and I think it's it can be quite hard to tease apart um, tease apart um, helping your student and helping helping your lecturer because in helping one we're we're helping the other so in deciding how we're going to go about doing it you need to conduct a needs analysis and that and we talked about the things that that would involve including um, analyzing the task and the available rubric um, analyzing samples of what the students can produce analyzing exemplars of what the lecturer wants them to produce um, observing classes interviewing um, tutors and lecturers focus groups with the students surveying the students um, gosh there's more um, class observations I always found very um, really um, very revealing when when we had the luxury of being able to do that um, yeah what else can you I, I think maybe you've done this before Sue Golliger <laughs> good good list in reality though I mean they're all fantastic in reality though if you if you're going to do one adjunct tutorial and you had to pick some of those because you're not going to be able to go and observe a lot and interview mm. students if you're just doing one tutorial. So are there some critical things that you think are the absolute must haves? Analyzing the task, because so often the way the task has been written is not clear to the students. It's not written in plain accessible language or um, there are embedded assumptions that the, even the lecture, the lecturer themselves are unaware that they, they carry um, understandings of what something means. And they're not aware that students don't share that common understanding with them. And the idea that sometimes when you're, when you're help looking, doing this and then sitting down and having your discussion with the lecturer afterwards that's where you're starting to help the lecturer because when you're asking those questions to say oh can tell me more about what this means or could you put this in other words or, or something you're actually guiding them to the realization that what they've put on paper is maybe not the clearest yeah absolutely okay um let's go to um Okay, uh, let's go and think about the academic now. Let me go room three, focusing on the academic. Who is from room three? We've forgotten who was in room three. We were talking about um, resources quite a lot in our room. I think I was in room three. Yep. Um, and just looking at what's available for the students, what has been provided, um, what is there for them. And very often there's a lot with uh, confusing or conflicting information, or there's very little. Um, so you could see where there's gaps in that kind of those support so resources that are actually available, say on Canvas or on Blackboard or whatever you're using. Yeah. Um, we also talked about having those kind the the resources that we could provide embedded into um, a rubric or um, available, you know, in the chat when you uh, deliver your workshops. So it's all based about the kind of resources that would, would be developed, uh, being able to show the academic the types of things that you already do and whether that's aligned with their expectation. Yep. So. Okay, let's stick with the academic, go to room two. I'm gonna pick on James to feedback because uh, I really liked some of the stuff that you were saying, James, about the academic, if you don't mind sharing. We were room, sorry, I didn't know which room I was in. I don't um, know, you, you talk, whatever room you were in. <laughs> um, yeah, so in addition to the needs analysis, and Sue mentioned um, looking at the task description and that sometimes, you know, there's problems within 
that uh, the clarity around that. Um, but what we we kind of talked about was, you know, those kinds of those kinds of problems, um, helping to upskill the academic themselves in, um, you know, uh, you know, improving the clarity of the communications, the you know, the clarity of the rubrics, the the scaffolding of the task, etc. So I think. You know, in this kind of situation where an academic has approached you with a particular need in mind and a particular problem that they've identified, just using this as an opportunity to, you know, deepen that relationship and um, provide some kind of deeper embedding work um, alongside, you know, this adjunct workshop. The adjunct workshop is sort of a way in to then build that trust and build that relationship um, to be able to, you know, help improve the course overall and, and upskill the, the academic in terms of communication, um, you know, uh, learning and teaching practices, um, and potentially even the tutorial or the tutor group as well, if it's a big course, um, looking at where, you know, things like feedback practices and stuff could be enhanced amongst the, the tutor group as well. So, you know, depending what your 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 budget and your time, and you, know, you could go into a whole lot of depth um, just from this initial contact by continuing that relationship and and, and building on it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and we talked about the fact that although you're delivering something to students, actually that relationship with the academic in some ways is just as important, if not more important, because mm -hmm. delivering delivering to one group of twenty five students. Um, if you can upskill the academic, they're going to um, be able to use that knowledge to upskill every uh, tube mm. group or lecture group that they interact with. So in mm. some ways, that's a better a better use of your resources, but a tr but a tricky relationship, which we might uh, we might talk about later. Mm. Um, okay, I'm going to go to room one now and go back to the student who was in room one. Any anything else? I think we've covered quite a bit. Sorry, sorry, room one. You get the sticky end of the lollipop there. Anything you'd like to talk about room one related to yes. the students? Um, Alex. Yeah, also talk about probably determining who the students are that need help, whether that statement about they can write English, what does it refer to? Does it refer to this cohort and it's based on samples from this cohort or is it something that usually happens? and the lecturer is being preemptive about it before the problem arises, or he has seen that writing problems in the emails or in the communication or board. So somebody suggested implementing a screening task to see if they are, if there is a particular group of students that need help, or is it everybody that needs help, and then probably delivering the, the workshop to the ones that that requires. Um, there was also probably we need to emphasize in the in the samples, like in the ones you highlighted uh, at the top in the first time we talked about uh, the task that is data analyzing the question, but also analyzing the rubrics and the samples, I think would be critical. Those would yeah. be the critical things to analyze. Yeah. Uh, and also ask if there is moderation for the margin. So we don't, if, if it's a large unit of study, there will be many tutors uh, marking. Do they mark differently? Do they have the same criteria for marking? Do they value the same aspects equally? So some tutors may be punishing students uh, on one aspect while others so that would be that would be more for the academic than for the students yeah, but yeah look I think you're right I think that's a, a sensitive one we have to be careful of our role role there but yeah no, we, okay. yeah we would just ask whether sure you can suggest it for sure you can yeah. suggest it okay all right I think um, we've picked up on all of the key things there so I'm going to hand over to Marta to move on to the next section thank you Pamela so we are now at the step three so we've already learned, so we've been approached, we've learned what the issue is, we've established a relationship with the academic, we, you know, scaffold, we looked at the task, we look at the rubrics, we look at the students' cohorts and so on. So we learned a lot. 
but now it's time that we design a workshop. So on step three is how would you design your workshop? So again, we'll go into breakup rooms and be back in about eight to 10 minutes. I think we get eight minutes um, just to really look at what is the design? What is a step-by-step? -step? What are we going to do in one hour and a half, one hour, two hours, or whatever we plan for? So we are going off to breakup rooms. Sophie, I think. What number do you want, Kat? Sorry, uh, I can go four again. Four, Martha? Yeah. You want me, is that? Sorry, one. One, John. Hey, Madeline, would you like me to put you into a breakout room?
Hey, are we all back yet? I think we are. Okay, welcome back. So we've just designed our workshop. So let's hear how did go, how did that go? Uh, we already know what we need we needed to know, and it is up to us now to really engage the students to focus on their learning, um, the outcomes, what we promised to the academics we're going to achieve, and also um, making sure that the students are engaged in our workshop. So you know we don't want to just be standing and giving another lecture. We do want to be engaged with that in, in, with the students with learners in that workshop. So let's see. Room, I don't know, I do not remember which room I was in, but let's go with room four first, please. Anyone? I'm gonna nominate us. Kit. Okay. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a hard task and to do it well, we had to make some assumptions. So we sort of made these assumptions. Uh, we've talked to the lecturer, we've ironed out their terrible rubric, it's all been fixed up, there's exemplars on Canvas or Moodle or Blackboard, and we've looked at past papers and we've worked out that there's problems here with academic English, the sorts of stuff that we can help with. So we identify the sorts of things that students are doing poorly, like, for example, uh, let's imagine it's a report. The language of introductions is done poorly. Uh, there's a, a conclusion section that's also done poorly. And throughout the whole thing, uh, there's referencing issues. Students aren't referencing properly and they're not bringing outside voices in properly. And it's all a big mess. So we've identified those things. And then it's just a matter of designing a workshop with those things as our aims. And, and that's it. We decide what it is can possibly be achievable in the time given. We make them the aims of the workshop and we design activities around that. It's a really great point you're making. What can be achievable? Because we only have usually an hour, hour and a half, you know, but it's probably not longer. And that that is very important thing not to overcommit. Some of the questions we talked about around the nitty gritty of designing a workshop is, let's say it's around writing, let's say it's around writing a report, for example, the question of whether we get the students to bring their own work in to work with, whether the workshops designed around them working on their own stuff, or whether you work from an exemplar. And so I think we all agree that there's pros and cons and, uh, uh, well, yeah, it's a kind of hard decision to make. Neither is really the perfect answer. Wonderful. Thank you for anything else. I'm pretty sure Kit summarized it really well. No, I let's just add we yeah. sorry, Martin. We did talk about adjusting the design of the workshop depending on the volume or size of the workshop. So um Alex will know, of course, that at, you said sometimes we've had six people in a workshop and yeah. 120 in a workshop. So how do you change your design depending on the, the number of students, scalability? That's a great point, uh, Kat, because I think in my group, we also talked about it. It's really, we as an educator, we need to be prepared for this. You know, you never know what classroom you're walking in. We might be prepared for 100, but we might have six students in there. What does that mean for my design? Thank you. Uh, room three, please. Any brave souls in room three? Anyone who can remember in room three? <laughs> I think I was in room three and, and I just want to share um, something that Tina mentioned. Um, thanks, Kit, for detailing what could get covered in the workshop. And um, we spent a little bit of time also talking about how it could get covered. Um, and, and Tina used the phrase, some ESL-like um, activities. And I think sometimes the, the benefit for students is just to realize that other people are struggling with the language perhaps that they need or the genre. And so understanding that um, they're all in this together um, and they get a chance to share perspectives and start the conversation about things that really matter to them like assessment um, is also really important. I think what Jess just said is really, really important. And what um, 
also sort of to, to add to that, by the, um, by the time the students have come to our workshop, they may have experienced some, I don't know, some failure or, or loss of confidence from their experience in their discipline classes. And so it's important to set up our workshop so that they are like a space where students can experiment with language and have a go and not um, f feel afraid to speak up like they may do in their regular classes. So did your group talk, were in the group, did you talk about how this would look like? Did you how, no, we, we talked about a lot of things, but um, we're, we're um, not, in, not in great depth, but in terms of, oh gosh, now you put me on the spot, the type of things, you, are you asking me to explain the type of things you'd do to make so the students would know that they're in a safe space? Yes, if there was any conversation around that, I just wondered. To... Uh, we didn't really have that conversation, but... Um, um, there's well, all, all sorts of different things and now that you've, I've been asked my brain has emptied but you know things like getting them in groups and starting off by discussing what happened with you know exercise x or how did you go and um, you know getting giving them a, a space to, to compare their experience with each other and realize that they're not the only people who struggled with that that right. would be a good start yeah, thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, that's okay. Wondered. And, and look, it is also depends if we already know the students. So I know that some of you are working with discipline, so you might already know the cohort. So if the students already know and have been in your workshops, that might be very helpful as well. Um, let's go to room two, please. Anyone for summary in room two? Um, that was us, but I think I'll shut up. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so what are we missing then? We're at room one. Dave, you were in room. Oh, Dave one. Oh, so maybe Dave has something to say. He was in room oh, two. Oh, yeah, I, I was in Sue's. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we, we also talked about the, the kind of generic things you would do it in any own workshop, like set objectives at the beginning, um, have some way of evaluating how well it works at the end. Mm. Um, But yeah, we, we find it pretty hard to talk without like the specific right. So a lot of assumptions, language <laughs> points or whatever that we were trying to, to work on. Yeah, so we, we kept it pretty generic. Yeah, really important that checking with the students what are what are the evaluations like even as we go through the workshops, just getting the students feedback. Are we on the right track? Are we addressing? what is needing to address. I think as educators, we do have a role to play that and to, to hear that we are on the right track with students. Yeah. Thank you, David. But, but it was also pointed out that um, th this is before the students have actually done the assessment. Um, so the students don't know how well they're going on the, on the assessment because they haven't had feedback yet. Yeah. yeah. So we, we talked about perhaps working through a um, I, I, if we have been provided with an example of some good work from previous years and we're allowed to show it and there's no fear that students are just going to copy it um, mm -hmm. and we can just work through it with the rubric and talk about why it's successful, what makes it successful, um, what the students need to aim for so that they've got some clarity about that. That's a very powerful tool if we have, if we have those examples. Thank you. And we... Truly need to go to room one. Um, I might talk about that. Just, I, I think I'm, I'll try not to repeat anything that someone's already mentioned, but um, one of the things was um, sort of during the session was referring to, um, referring students to other workshops that are being done already, that more generic ones and other um, academic language support services. And um, someone mentioned, sort of for engagement, you could have a video with a slice of humour and something that they can take away and come back to as well. Like if you've had time to look at some of what you're doing and it, even recording it might be might be useful. That's something I just thought of when I was thinking about the video. But I think um, the first group that spoke, I think wish we'd started off with some assumptions because it's kind of hard to design something like this without knowing um, exactly what to do. But one of the things that came up was just focusing on the prioritising the main issues for the, the cohort that from the information you've gathered, especially if you've only got a one-off session. I don't know, Alexandra and the others, did you have anything else to add? 
Well, I, I was with that room, Leslie. I think yeah. you've summarized, and lots of people have already said what we talked, but yeah, that were the main points. Okay, I think we have all of the room summary. So we've done a really good job in designing, uh, and we looked into assessment, we looked into rubrics. We, we, if we could, we would provide exemplars, good one and a bad one, to give a, a really good benchmark to students where we are. Uh, I think we mentioned the language and the scaffolding as well. Uh, one of the things maybe, and obviously checking with the student, with the learner as we go through the through the work through the workshop, the flexibility that Kat and that group mentioned is uh, you know very important for us as a, as educators because we just absolutely cannot be thrown out when we stop step into the new, this uh, classroom. Um, the one thing maybe. Uh, that will come through from possibly to the next one is if we have a lecturer in the class in the in the last step quite a few of you have mentioned it would be great to have a lecturer in the in the classroom because that adds to the value so we haven't quite looked at you know what are we going to do with the lecture but maybe that's in the next step so in in our last step i think i'm handing back to you kat yes thank you marta thank you everyone all right, so in the last step, we're going to stay together as a full room, <laughs> if you like, um, and we're going to think about how do we close the loop? How do we report back to the academic, um, both before the workshop and then after as well? How do we close the loop? Um, so let's just focus. Uh, I can see see everyone actually um so as a group why don't you use the raise your hand function and then we can get everyone's input so before uh delivering the workshop how would you or what would you sort of tell the academic what would you um how would you be that and we'll talk about after include them loop them in with what you're doing etc after you've designed it so i can see alex you've got your hand up uh, yes i think one thing that we usually do is to send them the slides mm. uh, beforehand and see if they have any feedback or any opinion on, on the content so that they can put something in. Let's say, oh, maybe you'd like to focus on blah, or, uh, or just for them to upload them to their Canvas site and have a look at them beforehand. Yeah, fantastic. So you're actually sort of like consulting with them and sort of just checking in with them that it's aligned with what they're sort of expecting from the workshop too. Yeah, great. Anything else you might do beforehand to loop them in? Any other ideas, Sue? You had your hand up. I was going to say um, you should you share your your materials with them. You know, yeah, ask for feedback. In my experience, they they rarely give it, but mm -hmm. um, ask for feedback and invite them to contribute. I often I invite them to come if they would like to. I Fantastic. invite them to yeah. attend. Yeah, yeah, because often it's the the inviting and the opportunity that's actually important and helps to build. The trust and rapport that you need as well whether they come or not is is another thing yeah and kit i was going to say if part of your workshop design is uh, a diagnostic a pre-commencement diagnostic you might share those results yeah. with the lecturer as well mm, yeah fantastic fantastic all right and what about oh. after so after you've done the <laughs> Um, after, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, after you've done the workshop, uh, how are you going to report back to the academic? How, what are you going to report back to them? How are you going to sort of close the loop? So this is just with the academic, to, you know, how are you going to show impact or efficacy of the workshop to the academic? I know it's potentially limited because it's only one workshop. How, what would you, what would you say to the academic? How would you approach them? What would you give them? Any ideas? 
Oh, Sue. So. Um, workshop evaluations, surveys mm -hmm. on exit. Um, some Alice has put that up. So, yeah, um, mm -hmm. using Microsoft Forms or whatever tool you have at, at your institute. Um, attendance. At, yeah, yes, attendance. Yeah, attendance. Yeah. 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 That, that doesn't always look so shiny, though. No, it doesn't. <laughs> when you get good attendance, that's when you take it. <laughs> so attendance, student feedback on the workshop, anything else? Kids? You might want to make a recommendation for next workshop, which would be in some ways a comment on this workshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Anything else? If it was, if there was a workshop centred around a, particular assignment, what kind of information might you be looking at? Maybe feedback results. How did the students, did they improve or did they, was there a noticeable difference or did they feel more confident, I suppose? Or Yeah, no, that sounds great, Madeline. Yeah, so, and you could even compare it potentially to past cohorts. Yes in terms of average marks on the assignment or something like that. that. Yeah. That would come from them because we wouldn't have access to marks from others. And so they are the ones who have to tell us whether they were yes. or not. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and I mean Alex, that's a really important point about that relationship with the academics and getting it where you can get the marks in order to show the impact of the intervention or the workshop. Yeah. Is there anything if, it's regular, if it's if it's regular workshops that's part of a program then i think that's much much easier to kind of have that longitudinal um, um insight or feedback yeah no that's a that's a really good point isn't it because often the work we do can be sort of isolated around sort of one unit of study and then it might stop for whatever reason different unit of study coordinator etc so it's really valuable to sort of continue a workshop or a program over time and also like it compare the results from every semester one as opposed to comparing semester one with semester two where there might be different variables that will change the results etc so there are lots of lots of things to consider anything else I think we've We've covered most of the things that, that we brainstormed. Maybe we... maybe just you might want to feed back to the lecturer if things come up in discussion in the class that the lecturer may perhaps not be aware of. That's something you might need to handle with sensitivity depending on what comes out. But sometimes in discussion, students will tell you things that they may not actually let their lecturers or tutors know. Yeah, that's a really good point too. And that goes back to the safe space of yeah. the learning support where it's not perceived as directly related to their lecturer or their unit of study as well. So they might disclose more as well. So the, and, yeah. But that's something that takes careful handling as well. You don't want to sort of betray any trusts or invade privacy or whatever. Yeah, or overstep the, yeah. the role as well. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, and Madeline? One more thing. Yeah. I think some of the most valuable feedback I've had was from students themselves. But once again, that's as, as part of a program is um, reasonably regular reflections. But at the end of the 10 week block, saying to them, I wanted to write about your support program. We call it ELS. What did you learn? What can you do now that you couldn't do before? And it's really very valuable. Because mm. um, that's, the, that's the students' feedback about their progress and particularly yes. had them for a 10-week block and another 10-week block because it's it's you know it's really it's such small steps but they mm. can see and it, i think if we get those positive reflection from them then it, it almost justifies you know running these programs mm. Um, mm. because the mm. students feel that they've made progress and they feel more confident about it yeah you you spot on with the um increasing their confidence to tackle other tasks in the future as well yeah yeah fantastic all right well I think we'll stop there for this section um so we've got time to wrap up and have a look at some sort of overarching principles so thanks everyone I'll hand over to Pamela again now thanks Kat okay so um the final section is really to try and summarize some of the overarching principles 
Uh, could we not have that yet, Sophie? Um, so what I'd like to do is just um, elicit from you, I think a lot of you are very experienced, but just to elicit from you, what are some of the guiding principles around developing an adjunct tutorial? It can be any random order, um, things that have occurred to you during today's session. Um, having a safe space or it being a safe space. Okay, yeah, a safe space where students feel that they can make some mistakes if need be and experiment a little bit. Yeah, what else? Perhaps the importance of that relationship with the, with the content specialist. Absolutely, yeah. Developing that relationship, watching the territory, um, recognising their expertise but also recognizing that we are the experts in academic language and learning. So it's, uh, you know, we're, we're both experts. We come at it from a different perspective. Yeah. Anything else? It was um, really diagnostic and, so, sorry, and really needs-based. Yeah, needs analysis, needs-based, diagnostic where possible. Kit, sorry, I didn't notice your hand there. That's okay. okay. Uh, Design your workshops or your shoots around what's possible, what's achievable. Yeah. Don't yeah. be put off by seemingly insurmountable issues like poor assessment design or uncommunicative lecturers. Design your workshops uh, around what you can do, what you can achieve. Yeah. yeah, what the students need and what's achievable in the time. Definitely, yeah. Uh, another one? Yeah. Seek feedback at the end. Yeah. From both stakeholders, so That's students right. and academic. Yeah, sure. I think something that came up particularly with step one and two is building a picture of all the different factors or the context that feeds in or contributes to that perception that students aren't doing well or the actuality that they're not doing well. Mm -hmm. understand the different factors because it may be different from what is first perceived that's right and you find that quite a lot I, I think you know there are some very experienced people in, in the workshop today that the the lecturer might perceive the issue the, the you know the students can't write in English I mean that's a very generic term what is it specifically we've got to drill down and and as you say Kat it's not always what they initially identify because they're not experts in English language they can't identify what it is necessarily necessarily yeah anything else okay um what we might do now is share the slide um thanks Sophie uh, a few that we put together uh, the conveners put together at the, uh, before the session. The first one we've kind of already uh, mentioned, which is that academics should be recognized um, as the discipline content expert. And we as the academic language and learning practitioner should be recognized as the, as the expert in our field as well. Both need to be respected and the different perspectives considered. So that's one that we've, we've already mentioned. Um, the next one we also, you also picked up on, which is, uh, the needs analysis, next one, please, thanks. Needs analysis and consultation needs to occur with the content specialist before you design the workshop. Um, otherwise, you're not necessarily going to, to hit the mark. Um, and again, it has to be manageable. You can't do a full needs analysis, but to find out as much as you can and to do that consultation before you design the workshop. Uh, next one. The next one is around um, measures of success. How are you and the academic going to agree that it was successful? Is it supporting the learning outcomes? Do you want to improve the pass rate? Is that possible with one workshop anyway? Um, is it to improve the grades? Is it to improve confidence? A bit more difficult to, to measure, um, but an important one, student satisfaction. Often for academics, faster marking is a real positive for them. If you can make the outputs better, then their marking is going to be faster. But on what are you going to measure it on? What is the measure of success? And it doesn't have to be pass rates and grades, actually. 
Um, you can see that there are, there are other factors. There may be qualitative, there may be quantitative, maybe a combination of the two, but important to consider. Um, the next one, we haven't really talked about this one, but it is something that we talked about together as a, as a, as a group when we were planning the workshop, that it is the discipline content that should drive post-entry material development. We have to remember that it's not, a, it's not an Ellicott classroom where language, where the content is, um, is irrelevant really, because language is the key uh, outcome. Remember that language is the vehicle uh, for the content, and, but it's not the driver in a post-entry uh, context. And that's something, if you come from an Ellicott background, that is a bit of a change of mindset. It's not just, I'm gonna do reporting verbs, I'm gonna do paraphrasing. It has to be within the discipline and the content has to drive it. So that's really critical. Uh, the next one, you did mention this one, that the input um, should support the design of the workshop. So it should be around the content, the assessment task, the rubric, the marking criteria. Um, so you, you did mention that one. The next one, uh, we didn't really talk about this one, but um, I think we've mentioned it in a previous session uh, of the PLSIG, where the workshop ideally will be targeted at something specific, maybe an assessment task, and certainly should be timed where possible for maximum impact rather than a generic workshop. Remember that generic is never as uh, impactful. They're not going to transfer the skills um, as well as if it's targeted. So we want it to be specific, timed, targeted, wherever possible. And the last one, you did mention this one, we need to evaluate the workshop for impact. Um, and, and ideally you would document that. It might be quantitative, qualitative, it might be the student feedback, the academics feedback, it might be grades, um, a whole range of different ways that it can be evaluated, but you should evaluate it. And ideally you would write that up and share it uh, with someone it may be the academic, it may be uh, your own boss, it may be people further up the food chain in the university, but it's always a good thing to, to document uh, the impact of everything that we do. So those are the principles that we came up with. Um, so together with the ones on the Padlet, um, I think we've got a pretty good uh, group of principles there. So it is 4.28, so I'm going to throw it open to uh, the floor now just for a couple of minutes for any final questions, comments, observations. And I can see that John has shared the Padlet, by the way, in the chat. But just to open up for anyone, so final comments. Pamela? Yes. Point four on your slides is really interesting to me. And can I nominate that as a potential topic for a future Peel uh, uh, workshop? Okay. What was number four again? <laughs> that the language uh, of the oh, discipline yeah. yep, yep. is the driver of the course. Yep. Sure. Thanks for that. Yeah, it's, it's a very different way of thinking from Ellicott where we think the content doesn't really matter. We might do something vaguely discipline specific, but the aim is the content rather than the language. So, you know, it's a different angle. Mm. Any other comments, questions? Happy to take any suggestions actually for what you'd like next year from this SIG because we haven't started to plan that yet. Okay, well, time is up. We did really well. It's 4.30 on the dot. Well done, Kat, Marta, John, Sophie. Well done, everybody. Thanks so much for coming today, everybody. I hope that was useful. Um, I know in some ways it was a little tricky because we were speaking kind of vaguely, um, but I hope that that stepping you through those various uh, stages was useful in some way. And uh, really hope that you're going to come to the rest of the conference next week and hope that you'll continue to come to the Peel SIG next year. Um, we'll be back in touch, I don't know, maybe February, March, something like that. So thanks very much everyone for your attendance. We'll be sharing the session. Uh, Sophie's just posted in the chat. We'll share the session recording um, and the Padlet. And I hope that was of some use to you. So thanks everybody. Maybe see you at the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks Bye. everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye. See ya.
Bye bye. Thanks, See you Pamela. Guys. Bye. bye. Thank bye. You. See you around, Jess. See you, Kit. <laughs> Well done, guys. We stop the recording. Yeah. Stop.